Humanist Perspective, presented by the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association. Following are a few principles of humanism. We're committed to the use of science and reason for understanding the universe and for solving human problems. We're skeptical of untested claims of knowledge, but we're open to new ideas. We are concerned with securing justice and fairness in society and in ending intolerance and discrimination. We are committed to the total separation of religion and government. We affirm humanism as a realistic alternative to the theologies of despair and the ideologies of violence. We reject the concept of an afterlife and believe in living a full and rewarding life here and now. We value and respect each individual's right to judge and lead their lives according to their own position as long as it's respectful of other people living in a free society. We hope you enjoy today's program and others in the weeks to follow. Hello folks, thanks for being back with us again. Our guest today is Mark Phillips, who is a professor at the University of New Orleans. And let me tell you a little bit about Mark. He received his BA in philosophy and French from California State University, which included a year abroad in France his M.A. in philosophy and literature from the University of Warwick in Coventry and his Ph.D. from Tulane University after a year at Purdue and a couple of years studying in Germany. His primary areas of interest are in pragmatism, evolutionary psychology, as well as the concept of God. Uh, he has published an article in History of Philosophy Quarterly where he explores the relationship between Emerson's concept of nature and Nietzsche's will to power. He is currently working on a book about religious behavior as self-identification. I didn't know you were writing a book. For the last 10 years, he has organized UNO's annual Darwin Day, an event hosting some of the best thinkers in the field of evolutionary psychology including Michael Roos, Michael Shermer, Daniel Dennett, and Robert Trivers. He also serves on the University Curriculum Committee. Now, I have a list here of the courses which he teaches or has taught. I'm just going to mention a couple of them. He teaches a course in ethics, social and political philosophy, Darwin and the evolution of thought, and the course that I'm interested in hearing about today, The Philosophy of Religion. And Mark, welcome to the show. And just tell us something about what is the course Philosophy of Religion? What do you cover? Well, as you know, having done those uh, Darwin days for so long, a lot of times uh, the people that would come to the uh, talks were concerned to either get rid of religion or see some sort of alternative explanation. And they have an alternative. <laughs> <laughs> they do. It's just that uh, most people who are interested in religion are theists. And so a class devoted to uh, the nature of religion, almost in the sense that an anthropo uh, anthropologist would study it, is really what we have in mind at UNO. Will you say, like an anthropologist, you're talking about the history of how it developed and where it came from? And right. All right. Well, we'd like to hear about that. Well, if uh, um, I guess I find the, the, the typical response to religion um, by atheists to be too, um, too brief. In other words, if I just say theists are crazy, there's no such thing as God, and they need to get over it. It still leaves me, as an atheist, with a, a need for an explanation of the phenomenon of religion. Well, I, I support what you just said, which is why I wanted you to come on this show, because it's easy enough to reject the idea of a supernatural being, which we secular humanists do, but there's more to it than that, which is what you're going to talk about. Yeah, well, we go through a series of lectures. Uh, the way we're setting things up now, uh, because we put these on iTunes, 
And um, so we set up 16 lectures, typically for each class, and in each one address a different aspect, in this case, a, a, a different aspect of religion. I'm, I'm computer illiterate. What does it mean that you're, you put your course on iTunes? Uh, we make little podcasts, something like your broadcast here. Yes. And then we upload them to iTunes so that anyone can watch them anytime. Without, without being a student at UNO, you mean? Yes. All words, right. Okay. So I could have watched that instead of asking you to be here. Exactly. All right. Well, carry on. <laughs> well, actually, a lot of people are worried about that because once these courses are available to anyone online, you really don't have any need for the professors themselves. Uh, you can put the stuff in the can, so to speak, and get rid of us. Now, you, you <coughs> to do that with other courses as well? Yes. Uh, actually, our department is the first one to uh, have a complete online degree. There are other uh, online courses you can take through UNO on iTunes, but we're the only department so far that has a, a complete degree possibility, so that you could take an entire, uh, earn an entire philosophy degree at home. All right, now how do you know when people are following you through iTunes, uh, the iTunes? Well, you don't know who is, but you get a, there's a count, as, uh, something like where the number of strikes on a page, so that if someone visits a site, there's a counter on it to say that X number of people have. So and in order for that to be credit against a degree, they have to take an examina a final examination or what? Yes, the only people that get credit for it are people who do it through UNO. So in but other words, then they do have to take an exam in oh, order yeah. to get in order to have that as one of their uh, credits toward a degree. Right, exams, term papers, whatever would be necessary in other courses. All right. Well, now you've told us the ways in which people can be exposed to the course. Tell us more about what 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 you teach in the course. Well, we start with um, kind of an overall view of uh, religion as a, a historical phenomenon and trace it from. <coughs> excuse me as uh, evolutionary folks would say, from its, its origins with primitive peoples, and then try to look at the different ways that people have tried to examine it through EEGs. Is something going on in the brain that causes us to experience certain phenomena in ways that we call religious? And then we look at different people or different specific religions uh, throughout history, and then different people who have criticized religion, either positively or negatively, and try to get, see the merits of each of those criticisms. How do you handle the fact that each of the various religions say theirs is the, only, the real and only one, and theirs is the only God? How do, you know, how, uh, philosophically, how do you handle that? I actually handle it differently than most people I, that I'm aware of handle it. It's actually what's led me to the idea of religion as self-identification. The reason that we are the chosen people is basically because we're us. And whoever we happen to be is always going to be the people who say, God likes us or God made the world for us, etc. Well, uh, as, as you know, I am by heritage Jewish. Mm -hmm. It is not my religion. Mm -hmm. But the Jews are the, are the chosen people by God, so I don't know how anyone else can make that claim. Well, and, and one would wonder why you would jump out of that uh, group. You were already chosen by God. Um, the, the, the question I get sometimes is, how are atheists or humanists to think of themselves since if, if I'm thinking of religion as self-identification? Uh, but you and I, as non-believers, let's say, go through a similar process. We still have to figure out who we are in the grand scheme of things. Mm -hmm. We're just able to do it in ways that weren't available to our ancestors, say your Jewish ancestors. Because we have available to us advanced, what, scientific knowledge? Or what, what makes it different today from what it was, you know, uh, some, uh, centuries ago. That's a likely possibility. Science has been the one uh, avenue that people could take. Uh, a lot of people now are suggesting the arts, though, as uh, a means of supplanting or providing those things that religion did in the past. I really just need to tell some kind of narrative about how I fit into things generally. So science is, uh, for people of our ilk, 
science would now, fill is that, that role. a matter of philosophy or psychology? Well, I don't see them as, as distinct. Um, the move, this is another way in which I'll differ from most Darwinians. Um, the move from philosophy to psychology, to my mind, is a result of people like William James taking people like Darwin seriously and thinking of the mind as the way that you and I interact with the world, rather than as philosophers typically have and theologians typically have as something distinct from the body. Uh, in You're the talking way, about a soul? Yeah, a soul or a mind. Uh, part of the, the difference in the way that I approach religion is that uh, most people who criticize religion are saying there's no such thing as a soul, but they still want to retain the idea of a mind as a distinct oh, yes. thing along something like Descartes' idea. That even if I, in print, deny the existence of the mind, I always talk as if I'm something other than this body. The, the difference with uh, uh, what uh, was called on there a pragmatist approach, taking something like James' appropriation of Darwin, is that instead of doing philosophy, we now have to do psychology because there's, there isn't something, to that way of thinking, there isn't something called a mind that allows us to do what philosophers had traditionally called epistemology or metaphysics before. I can't find out how the world really is, which is what both philosophers and the, the theists had wanted. I can only figure out how I think things are or how we think things are. Well, when you say I, it's something that's going on inside your brain, mm -hmm. which people call a mind, which I'm willing to accept. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but then, but the religious people go a step farther, which in my opinion is what they call soul, mm -hmm. which we, we uh, non-religious people reject that concept because uh, a soul presumably lives on after the physical body is dead mm -hmm. and may go to a wonderful place up there or a terrible place down there. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but there are countless people in the world who find that perfectly reasonable. Is that your, your understanding? Yes, and I, I, I guess what we're trying to account for is why they find it. Uh, not just appealing, but understandable. Okay. Something that they genuinely like, think is the case. I'd like to hear your answer as to why. Uh, for the same reason that you and I think we have minds. Uh, in other words, uh, the way you and I talk about our minds implies that there's something inside of us other than our physiology, other than this organism. So that you and I are things that can have bodies or even have minds. Uh, instead of saying, I think mind is just a label for some of the functions this organism is capable of. Okay. Imagine that you and I, as atheists, say, look at theists and think, what they're calling soul is really just a word to describe their emotions and their sense of self and they're taking it too seriously. They think they're a distinct thing that's going to outlive the death of their body. That's, what, that's the part of soul that, that uh, impresses me, that it is something that continues after your physical demise. Right. Now, uh, I don't know whether this is a topic that you cover at all, but there's a, there are these people who claim that they have had uh, they, it's called near-death experiences when they say they were dead mm -hmm. and then came back to life. All sorts of reports of people and they tell you, you know, that they were above their operating table looking down at their dead body and whatever. Mm -hmm. but, but what they seem to just glide over is that they're calling it near death. They weren't dead. Right. Well, of course, anything can happen if you're still alive, but they claim that they, that they died. Mm -hmm. Now, do you cover that topic in any way when you talk about the philosophy of religion? A little bit. Um, there are studies that show that you and I are capable of seeing ourselves from outside ourselves and that it's a very useful thing to be able to do. 
just like visualizing what's going to happen next Saturday when I run that errand. I have to talk to so and so and I can kind of think of myself from a third person perspective. So we know that we're able to do that kind of thing. But now these people who report these near-death experiences say they can tell you what the uh, doctors and nurses were saying, not just what was in their mind, but what was occurring. Uh, how, do you, how, uh, how do you account for that? Uh, I would account for it by thinking that my brain's capable of things that are greater than I am, is a way of putting it. And this is a roundabout way for me to, to save theists for the, th to save theism for theists. However, to answer your question, I've had what someone would call a near-death experience. Ha having lost a lot of blood at one point, my, my vision went white. It went out in a pixelated way so that while looking at you, it would be as if someone were slowly turning off the TV set. Now I can think of that as going toward the light, but I can also think of it as just my ability to see and to think receding as I die, right? As a materialist might take that approach instead of saying I'm moving toward heaven or something like that, or I saw a great light. Um, and I think that's what theists are doing, that they're projecting this notion of moving toward heaven as that. However, I personally don't have a problem with it because I don't think of myself, and this is the point I'm trying to make with minds, I don't think of myself as a distinct thing. When I die, the ability this organism has to produce me, the thing I call me, our mind, mm -hmm. or they would want to call soul, when that goes away, it won't be something I did. It'll be something that this organism stopped doing. And so my agreement with the theists is actually, um, let's say, against atheists who want to retain themselves as an agent. And I'm trying to suggest that to the atheists that they see the theists' side of things by saying, if you and I are organisms, there isn't a thing called Harry or Mark inside this thing. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I understand what you just said. It's what Gilbert Ryle called the ghost in the machine. You and I still talk as if there's a thing called Harry and a thing called Mark. The, inside that, here. An agent that does things with this body. Well, I, uh, I consider that to be factual. And, and what I'm suggesting is that the theist is, I'm trying to, to tell the atheist that the theist is simply saying, or one way of thinking of what the theist is saying is, think of the organism as doing everything, including what you and I call Harry and Mark. So that when, I, when the blood comes out of my veins too quickly, and Mark recedes into the organism, then the organism is no longer able to produce a conscious agent. From, from up here? Right. Okay. Um, you and I will then have died. But there won't be a ghost that's come out of the machine, which is your point, uh -huh. right? There won't be a soul called Harry that comes out of it. That's my position. That is your <laughs> position. I'm just saying, uh, if we take the position now while we're alive and say there is no thing, no mind called Harry, there's no mind called Mark, it's just a capability, a name for a collection of capabilities that these organisms have. Well, I'm not sure I understand that, but but I understand that, that there's a brain with a, with uncounted number of cells mm -hmm. making connections, and these connections become understandable concepts mm -hmm. inside my head. Yes. If my head is dead, <laughs> they're gone, aren't they? <laughs> uh, they are for you. And of course, uh, philosophers get in all kinds of arguments about whether concepts can exist independently of people who know them. But I guess the, uh, the point is, when with, like say, the development of the brain initiative right now, there are people who are studying, and the U.S. government has given a lot of money for this, to study how our brains produce us, among other things. Okay. So we want to know what's going on inside our skulls that make Harry and Mark. Is it your opinion that there, that there will be better, some further explanations beyond what, you, what we have now? Yes. 
coming from philosophy, psychology, or physiology, or where is it going to come from? Coming from or all, religion? Coming from all those fields, but especially neuroscience. Neuroscience. I mean, we're to, neuroscience, we're going to find a lot more about the nature of the brain and how it works and how you and I get produced. Okay, well, you know, we, we uh, secular humanists can certainly endorse neuroscience. Of course. Yes, in fact, uh, there's, there's nothing about the, the way that I teach um, uh, philosophy of religion that suggests anything like hocus pocus. But it is meant to address audiences who are believers so that they are not alienated by the Darwinian or atheist uh, rhetoric. Well, now, of course, you don't know what kind of reaction the people have who are doing this online, but in your live classes, mm -hmm. which I would assume include maybe some or most religious people, at the end of the course, how do they feel? How do they react? What do they say to you? Most of them uh, seem to like the course because they find out a lot about religion. Um, uh, I couldn't say as far as uh, me as an instructor, but I think that most people tend to take away from a class the things that they're interested in. So if enough things are provided for them, then they will glean the things they need to. And, I, and rather than dictating what I think the nature of religion is, I had rather they appropriate the things, and I think they're necessarily going to do it anyway, appropriate the things that are beneficial to them. And the ones who come into the class being religious, do any of them by the end of the course say, I'm rethinking my position? Uh, yes, not usually a lot of conversions, but it's caused me to think a lot. Okay. I've, I've sort of questioned some of the assumptions. Okay. I have. So you're not you're not uh, making more recruits for the secular humanist organization. Not intentionally, <laughs> <laughs> but right. but neither am I trying to convince people that uh, that God exists or. All right. Now you said you have like sixteen segments that you're. What are some of, What are some of them that we haven't talked about? I wish I could remember. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I really just don't off the top of my head, but all I can tell you is that they are listed on um, uh, iTunes. You have to go to iTunes U. And uh, it, the reason I can't remember is because I also do a, a modern, a history of modern philosophy, uh, the introduction to philosophy, um, other classes I'm not remembering right now. And, you, and they're all on the I, uh, iTunes, uh, or some of them are. Not, uh, yeah, they, we're getting more and more each semester. All right. Now, if people watching this show are interested in, in picking up one of your courses, uh, electronically. Mm -hmm. Say again what they have to do. Uh, they have to go to iTunes, and then iTunes contains a, a portion called iTunes U, uh, which has just a, a letter U. <clears throat> right, I, iTunes like you're used to seeing it with the U attached at the end. Okay, and there will be um, a huge list of, of universities throughout the world that are doing this. I see. So then they go to UNO, and then right. they go to the philosophy department, and then they're they just look up the subject philosophy. Okay, and uh, and they'll find everything that we have, and then of course, if you do a if you do a search like that at the beginning, you could find it for every university that's All right. involved. Now let me see if I understand. Uh, what what they see on the computer is what you they see you live teaching a course, no, or what do they see? Some people do that. Some people have their face on and they just to talk the whole time. I do a PowerPoint presentation and then talk over that, so they're seeing pictures of historical figures or uh, citations from texts. Right. So they get your voice, but you're not necessarily a picture of you. No, in fact, because I've got, for example, I have a, a student who's blind this semester, and she's only able to read the textbook or read the uh, slides. I have a separate uh, PDF file for people who just want to look at the slides. She, can't, she couldn't hear me anyway, and so she's basically going with the slides and the textbook. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, we've got a few more minutes left. Uh, what, what would you like our audience to uh, know about what's, what you're teaching and what's happening at UNO or whatever? Well, uh, as you know, since Katrina, uh, we've lost a lot of students. Uh, as a result, lost a number of faculty. Um, I guess I'd like them to know we're still here. 
Yes. Uh, that we're still uh, uh, doing our best to uh, uh, generate curricula that are worthwhile for the students of this area uh, and hope they start uh, signing up again in bigger numbers. All right. I'm just looking at, uh, uh, at something that I got off, off, off the internet. It says, the object of this course will be to figure out what different people understand by such terms as religion, spirituality, or even God. Now, I hear people say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. What does spiritual mean to you? Well, um, <clears throat> Because I run into people who use the word religion to mean something institutionalized, and then people who also use it as a synonym for spirituality. Um, to me, spirituality uh, usually implies something like the kind of thing you were talking about earlier with souls. Um, if I think of something as spirited myself, I think of it as lively. Uh -huh. So I don't usually take uh, the typical religious uh, or make the, the typical religious analogy. If someone tells me they're spiritual, it really, I, I don't have a problem with it because to me it just means they're trying actively to figure out their role in the world. So I think a, a secular humanist could be spiritual. Well, how does that uh, uh why do people compare that to religion? They say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, implying that it's something like religion. Because I think they want to give up the dogma or creed, say as you did your Judaism. In other words, uh, you may still find uh, certain affiliations with certain parts of the Jewish culture or traditions, yeah. but uh -huh. have no link no feeling about God or whatever attached exactly. to Exactly. You know, I'm, pr I'm proud of my tradition of the Jews that came before me and the, and the hardships they endured and, and, and they have endured, I, you know, I just don't accept the, the, uh, the God part of it. Right. And see, and I, I felt the same way. As a child, I would be around people that I uh, cared a great deal for, but I, they said things to me that didn't make sense. And so I realized that there must be something about those people that needed uh, not in the crutch sense, but needed this spirituality or this religion. All right. Well, listen, Mark, our time is, is uh, up. I did want to possibly uh, ask you about another course that having to do with, um, uh, well, I've forgotten what it was now, but uh, our time is up. Okay. I want to thank you very much for being here with well, me. Well, thank you for having me. And I want to thank Larry Perkins, who is our sole production man here at the studio who works with us every Saturday. Thank you folks for being here and uh, come watch our show often. <laughs>